What is a vampire? Among the specialists, the writers upon vampire lore and legend, two definitions may be quoted. Hurst, who says that, a vampire is a dead body which continues to live in the grave, which it leaves, however, by night, for the purpose of sucking the blood of the living, whereby it is nourished and preserved in good condition, instead of becoming decomposed like other dead bodies. And Scoffin, who wrote, the best definition I can give of a vampire is a living, mischievous, and murderous dead body. A living dead body. The words are idle, contradictory, incomprehensible, but so are vampires. Vampires, says the learned Zopfius, come out of their graves in the nighttime, rush upon people sleeping in their beds, suck out all their blood, and destroy them. They attack men, women, and children, sparing neither age nor sex. Those who are under the malignity of their influence complain of suffocation and a total deficiency of spirits, after which they soon expire. Some of them being asked at the point of death, what is the matter with them? Their answer is that such persons lately dead rise to torment them. Not all vampires, however, are or were suckers of blood. Some, according to the records, dispatched their victims by inflicting upon them contagious diseases or strangling them without drawing blood or causing their speedy or retarded death by various other means. The word vampire is held by Skeet to be derived from the Servian Wampira. The Russians, Morlachians, inhabitants of Montenegro, Bohemians, Servians, Arnots, both of Hydra and Albania, know the vampire under the name of Vukodalak Vurkulaka Ovrikolaka, a word which means wolf fairy and is thought by some to be derived from the Greek. In Crete, where Slavonic influence has not been felt, the vampire is known by the name of Katakana. Vampire lore is, in general, confined to stories of resuscitated corpses of male human beings, though amongst the Malays, a penanglan, or vampire, is a living witch who can be killed if she can be caught in the act of witchery. She is especially feared in houses where a birth has taken place and it is the custom to hang up a bunch of thistle in order to catch her. She is said to keep vinegar at home to aid her in re-entering her own body. In the Malay Peninsula, parts of Polynesia and the neighboring districts, the vampire is conceived as a head with entrails attached, which comes forth to suck the blood of living human beings. In Transylvania, the belief prevails that every person killed by a Nosferatu, vampire becomes in turn a vampire and will continue to suck the blood of other innocent people until the evil spirit has been exorcised, either by opening the grave of the suspected person and driving a stake through the corpse or firing a pistol shot into the coffin. In very obstinate cases, it is further recommended to cut off the head, fill the mouth with garlic, and then replace the head in its proper place in the coffin, or else to extract the heart and burn it and strew the ashes over the grave. The Moroni of the Wallachians not only sucks blood, but also possesses the power of assuming a variety of shapes, as, for instance, those of a cat, dog, flea, or spider, in consequence of which the ordinary evidence of death caused by the attack of a vampire visuos, the mark of a bite in the back of the neck, is not considered indispensable. The Wallachians have a very great fear of sudden death, greater, perhaps, than any other people, for they attribute sudden death to the attack of a vampire and believe that anyone destroyed by a vampire must become a vampire and that no power can save him from this fate. A similar belief obtains in northern Albania, where it is also held that a wandering spirit has power to enter the body of any individual guilty of undetected crime and that such obsession forms part of his punishment. Some writers have ascribed the origin of the belief in vampires to Greek Christianity but there are traces of the superstition and belief at a considerably earlier date than this. Vampirism found a place in Babylonian belief and in the folklore and traditions of many countries of the Near East. The belief was quite common in Arabia, although there is no trace of it there in pre-Christian times. The earliest references to vampires are found in Chaldean and Assyrian tablets. Later, the pagan Romans gave their adherence to the belief that the dead bodies of certain people could be allured from their graves by sorcerers, unless the bodies had actually undergone decomposition and that the only means of effectually preventing such resurrections was by cremating the remains. In Grecian lore, there are many wonderful stories of the dead rising from their graves and feasting upon the blood of the young and beautiful. From Greece and Rome, 
the superstition spread throughout Austria, Hungary, Lorraine, Poland, Romania, Iceland, and even to the British Isles, reaching its height in the period from 1723 to 1735, when a vampire fever or epidemic broke out in the southeast of Europe, particularly in Hungary and Serbia. Various devices have been resorted to in different countries at the time of burial, in the belief that the dead could thus be prevented from returning to earth life. In some instances, that is, among the Wallachians, a long nail was driven through the skull of the corpse and the thorny stem of a wild rose bush laid upon the body in order that its shroud might become entangled with it should it attempt to rise. The Croats and Slavonians burned the straw upon which the suspected body lay. They then locked up all the cats and dogs, for if these animals stepped over the corpse, it would assuredly return as a vampire and suck the blood of the village folk. Many held that to drive a white thorn stake through the dead body rendered the vampire harmless. The driving of a stake through the body does not seem to have had always the desired effect. Deschartes, in his Magia Postuma, published at Olmutz in 1706, tells of a shepherd in the village of Blo, near Kadam in Bohemia, who made several appearances after his death and called certain persons who never failed to die within eight days of such call. The peasants of Blo took up the body and fixed it to the ground by means of a stake driven through the corpse. The man, when in that condition, told them that they were very good to give him a stick with which he could defend himself against the dogs which worried him. Notwithstanding the stake, he got up again that same night, alarmed many people and, presumably out of revenge, strangled more people in that one night than he had ever done on a single occasion before. It was decided to hand over his body to the public executioner, who was ordered to see that the remains were burned outside the village. When the executioner and his assistants attempted to move the corpse for that purpose, it howled like a madman and moved its feet and hands as though it were alive. They then pierced the body through with stakes, but he again uttered loud cries, and a great quantity of bright vermilion blood flowed from him. The cremation, however, put an end to the apparition and haunting of the spectre. Deschartes says that the only remedy for these apparitions is to cut off the heads and burn the bodies of those who come back to haunt their former abodes. It was, however, customary to hold a public inquiry and examination of witnesses before proceeding to the burning of a body. And if, upon examination of the body, it was found that the corpse had begun to decompose, that the limbs were not supple and mobile, and the blood not fluidic, then burning was not commanded. Even in the case of suspected persons, an interval of six to seven weeks was always allowed to lapse before the grave was opened in order to ascertain whether the flesh had decayed and the limbs lost their suppleness and mobility. Bartholin in De Causa Contemptus Mortis tells the story of a man named Harpy who ordered his wife to bury him exactly at the kitchen door in order that he might see what went on in the house. The woman executed her commission and soon after his death he appeared to several people in the neighborhood, killed people while they were engaged in their occupations and played so many mischievous pranks that the inhabitants began to move away from the village. At last a man named Olauspa took courage and ran at the spectre with a lance which he drove into the apparition. The spectre instantly vanished, taking the spear with it. Next morning, Olaus had the grave of Harpy opened when he found the lance in the dead body which had not become corrupted. The corpse was then taken from the grave, burned, and the ashes thrown into the sea, and the spectre did not afterwards trouble the inhabitants. To cross the arms of the corpse, or to place a cross or crucifix upon the grave, or to bury a suspected corpse at the junction of four crossroads was, in some parts, regarded as an efficacious preventive of vampirism. One charm employed by the Wallachians to prevent a person becoming a vampire was to rub the body in certain parts with the lard of a pig killed on St. Ignatius's day. In Poland and Russia, vampires make their appearance from noon to midnight instead of between nightfall and dawn, the rule that generally prevails. They come and suck the blood of living men and animals in such abundance that sometimes it flows from them at the nose and ears, and occasionally in such profusion that the corpse swims in the blood, thus oozing from it as it lies in the coffin. 
Sometimes heavy stones were piled on the grave to keep the ghost within, a practice to which Fraser traces the origin of funeral cairns and tombstones. Two resolutions of the Sorbonne, passed between 1700 and 1710, prohibited the cutting off of the heads and the maiming of the bodies of persons supposed to be vampires. The methods employed for the detection of vampires have varied according to the countries in which the belief in their existence was maintained. In some places, it was held that if there were discovered in a grave two or three or more holes about the size of a man's finger, it would almost certainly follow that a body with all the marks of vampirism would be discovered within the grave. The Wallachians employed a rather elaborate method of divination. They were in the habit of choosing a boy young enough to make it certain that he was innocent of any impurity. He was then placed on an absolutely black and unmutilated horse which had never stumbled. The horse was then made to ride about the cemetery and pass over all the graves. If the horse refused to pass over any grave, even in spite of repeated blows, that grave was believed to shelter a vampire. Their records state that when such a grave was opened, it was generally found to contain a corpse as fat and handsome as that of a full-blooded man quietly sleeping. The finest vermilion blood would flow from the throat when cut, and this was held to be the blood he had sucked from the veins of living people. It is said that the attacks of the vampire generally ceased on this being done. In the town of Pelepe, between Monastru and Kiuprili, there existed the extraordinary phenomenon of a number of families who were regarded as being the offspring of Rikolakas and as possessing the power of laying the wandering spirits to which they were related. They are said to have kept their art very dark and to have practiced it in secret, but their fame was so widely spread that persons in need of such deliverance were accustomed to send for them from other cities. In ordinary life and intercourse, they were avoided by all the inhabitants. Although some writers have contended that no vampire has yet been caught in the act of vampirism, and that as no museum of natural history has secured a specimen, the whole of the stories concerning vampires may be regarded as mythical. Others have held firmly to a belief in their existence and inimical power. Dr. Pierrat, in La Revue Spiritualiste, wrote, After a crowd of facts of vampirism so often proved, shall we say that there are no more to be had, and that these never had a foundation? Nothing comes of nothing. Every belief, every custom, springs from facts and causes which give it birth. If one had never seen appear in the bosom of their families, in various countries, beings clothed in the appearance of departed ones known to them, sucking the blood of one or more persons, and if the deaths of the victims had not followed after such apparitions, the disinterment of corpses would not have taken place, and there would never have been the attestation of the otherwise incredible fact of persons buried for several years being found with the body soft and flexible, the eyes wide open, the complexion rosy, the mouth and nose full of blood, and the blood flowing fully when the body was struck or wounded or the head cut off. Bishop Davranches Hewitt wrote, I will not examine whether the facts of vampirism, which are constantly being reported, are true or the fruit of a popular error, but it is beyond doubt that they are testified to by so many able and trustworthy authors and by so many eyewitnesses that no one ought to decide the question without a good deal of caution.